I was trying to be Green Day and Metallica <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> totally makes sense. I see. I see how your sound um, has come from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Spender, and welcome to the first Tuesday Talks episode of 2021. You are about to see my conversation with Cory Wong, who is not only a solo artist in his own right, but also performs with Wolfpack. And now he's just announced that he's combining all his talents as a performer, band leader, and talk show host in his extraordinary Corrie and the Wong Notes variety show. It was an honor to meet him for the first time, over Zoom, of course, but even this video isn't the full conversation. So if you are wanting to see the whole extended interview, you can watch it over on Nebula. The best way to access Nebula is by signing up to a subscription for CuriosityStream, who are very kindly sponsoring this video. And if you aren't already aware, Curiosity Stream is the best place on the internet to see thousands of the world's finest documentaries and non-fiction titles. For a limited time, Curiosity Stream is offering 41% off their annual plans. That's less than $12 a year for Curiosity Stream and Nebula, which is a pretty amazing bundle. So grab a cuppa and enjoy my conversation with Corey Wong. Tuesday, 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 Tuesday talks. When did you start playing guitar? Was guitar your first instrument? My first instrument was bass. Interesting. Bass, yeah, so bass guitar or double bass or? Bass guitar, yeah, electric mm -hmm. bass. My favorite bands were Red Hot Chili Peppers and Primus. <laughs> so. Okay. Two bass guitar heavy bands. Mm -hmm. And. I really just wanted to start a band so bad that the other people that I could start a band with at my school, one guy had a bass at his house and another one of my friends had a drum set. So we couldn't have a band with two bass players. So I said, screw it, I'll learn how to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. And I've been stuck playing the guitar ever since. <laughs> Although it's great, but it's funny because my expectation, some people, the way that they look at the bass guitar is, Oh, just hold down the low notes. It's easy, whatever. For me, the bass is such a huge thing. It, and, and any band that I play with, the bass player's got to be killing. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way that it always has been for me. I've always wanted the bass to be... I, I don't have to be playing it, but to me, the bass role is so much more than ones, fives, downbeats. You know, yeah. sure, get the, get the one on the downbeat, but... It's got to be exciting and there has to be something moving. So I started on bass guitar, still love the bass guitar, and then moved over to guitar because that's what I needed to do in the role of the band that I wanted to start. And I just, I now love the guitar. I feel like when I started playing the Stratocaster, I felt like, ah, I'm at home. I found my voice. Yeah. So like, the Stratocaster feels like home. A J bass feels like home. There's a certain roundness and a certain bubbliness mm -hmm. sound all you know, to the tone on both of them that for whatever reason just feels like I connect with like it feels like like it's able to draw me out better of course I'm going to come out in whatever instrument I play but the Stratocaster the J bass those I feel like they 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 pull it out of me just effortlessly mm-hmm and so what ages are we talking of starting bass? 13. Right. And then what? Well, 12. I started when I was 12. Okay. And then I got serious about music when I was 13. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what did your, what did that band look like initially in its first incarnation? And where we were, were you? Were you in Minneapolis or were you in? Yeah. Right, right. I was trying to be Green Day and Metallica <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> totally makes sense. I see. I see how your sound um, has come from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was obsessed with Green Day and Blink One Eighty Two and Red Hot Chili Peppers oh. and Primus, like I said. Yeah, and and all the peripherals in that: Foo Fighters, Smashing Pumpkins, Maroon Five. It, it kind of developed that 
Dave Matthews band and then all of a sudden more of the jam thing and it's just kind of weaved its way and then I had a big jazz phase where I listened to so much of that and all the funk stuff was there the whole time and being in Minneapolis the Prince thing is just kind of everywhere Mm -hmm. if you're in some of the working scene depending on what scene you're in but I was in a lot of the R&B and funk scene in Minneapolis so Mm -hmm. it just naturally came out of me and that's maybe why it's just such a prominent part of my voice on the instrument is just by nature of where I came from. I feel you just were always going to figure out a way to be a full-time musician. Is that how you found it? I think so. I didn't, I, it was obvious to everybody around me. Yeah. But I don't think it was obvious to me. To me, it felt like, and maybe even still, Oh, no, it's different now now because I have like managers and, you know, I'm, you know, by by pretty much any, I don't say this any other way than it's kind of objectively like becoming a successful musician, whatever that means. You know, I think objectively at this point, I would be considered that great. Doesn't mean that I'm like some famous superstar. It does. That's not what defines success. I think what defines success is much deeper, which we either can or go don't have to go into but i think for me it started as something where everybody around me knew that this was what i was made to do Mm -hmm. it's what i'm most passionate about it's what is probably one of the things that uh, aside from some some of my i mean your personality comes out in your music if you're doing it as art and it's one of the things that's most magnetic about me so for me, I just thought this is something that I'm just driven to do and I have a lot of fun and it's something I'm passionate about, but I kind of need a real job. And mm-hmm. so when I decided to go to university, I chose science because I thought, oh, I need to get an actual, you know, actual degree and then I'll figure it out. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll, I was going to go to nursing school or do something in biology. Um, I knew I had a couple safety nets with the computer stuff because I've always just been really good with computers. Um, And also when I was in high school, I did a drafting program, like a cat computer-aided design. So I, while I was in high school, so um, at 16, Mm -hmm. uh, I got a job for an architect you know, where wow. you like make blueprints and stuff. Yeah. Buildings. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I just, I figured out the pro. I, I had great classes at my school, but I was really good at this program. And I knew I could get a job as a drafter. Yeah. From my experience and from these classes that I took, fortunately. So, so oh, screw it. I'll, I'll get a science degree. I have this other backup plan and with, I'll do something with computers. I don't know. Or I'll be a drafter. You know, in your early 20s, you just try to figure out what am I really meant to do? Mm-hmm. What, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And mm-hmm. it felt like it was much more than what, not more, because for a lot of people, the science thing is, is the their life. It's, yeah, it's the yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the so I, I don't mean that I, more is completely the wrong word. Sorry. Something different. And it was music. And as soon as I let that switch turn on in my brain, it was just so obvious. And it was just Mm -hmm. right there in front of me. So I don't think you, I I think you're right in saying that I was going to make it happen. I just didn't always realize it. I've played sessions for tons of artists, everybody from, well, I toured a lot with this guy named Ben Rector, who's a pop Mm -hmm. singer songwriter. Yeah. And session wise, I did a lot of stuff in Nashville. So there's a bunch of different, um producers there that Mm -hmm. the producers are kind of the ones that hire you so i even i've done stuff everybody from blake shelton to i did a thing for florida georgia line i don't even remember what the song is you wouldn't (laughs) notice that it's me on it they probably don't even know that it's me on the song the producer hired me to do it right um yeah just a bunch of singer songwriters a lot of stuff in nashville in the christian music scene because there's a couple producers that i knew in that realm some pop stuff um, and then Jack kind of absorbed me into Wolfpack and that started to explode. 
and then I started doing my own solo thing. So it's all just kind of grown from, uh, I don't know. And I think I'm still catching up in my mind on where, where I'm at with things. Like, uh, I don't know. It's kind of like, what, it feels like stuff, it feels like things took forever and also just happened really fast. Yeah. So because of that, um, I try to be, I try to be as self-aware as possible on where, on where I'm at with, with mm-hmm. stuff. With Wolfpack, how did you come on board and then, and then Madison Square Garden? <laughs> like, tell me that story and that timeline. Um, the quick version would be, I was playing a gig at this place in Minneapolis called Bunkers. I was part of this house band for a while. And some of the guys from Wolfpack, at that point, it was just kind of this internet band that Jack started. Mm-hmm. I guess it actually originally started kind of as a YouTube act. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, th- so they were playing with uh, a guy named Darren Chris, um, who's now like a celebrity, mm-hmm. uh, which is awesome. And it's also kind of funny because I know Darren from years ago too, but that's just kind of the way it goes. If people are really good at something, they get well known. Mm-hmm. How about that? Mm-hmm. Um, so they were playing for a singer, Darren Chris, and they were on tour and those guys came to see like uh, this thing at Bunkers. A lot of people would come if, uh, cause it was a Sunday night, Sunday, Monday jam, but just a band that just was freaking awesome. Uh, and most, uh, pretty much everybody in the band was all Prince alumni, except for me. So, uh, People like it's one of those things. Oh, what are you guys? What are you guys gonna do after your gig? You guys, you should head down to Bunkers. There's this awesome band, and a bunch of people told them about this, and blah blah blah. And we had some mutual friends, so they came down to see the band, and I was playing on set break. We just started hanging out, talking, became friends, had breakfast the next morning, and then eventually just became friends. I was going to L.A. a lot for work at the time. We would hang out. Eventually, started playing a little bit together. And then Jack asked me to record on an album and then do some shows. And then he just kind of absorbed me into the band. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I signed a contract. It wasn't like we got engaged and had a a wedding. (laughs) It was just. (laughs) You'd done that already. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I was just absorbed into the whole. The family. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, And then we just started touring for a few years and then and and not a lot like the most shows maybe 24 shows in 2018 or 2019 or something Mm -hmm. no yeah in 2018 i think we did like 24 shows and that was a lot for the band at the time which is nothing to most to some bands i was just uh doing a, a online writing session with somebody the other day so weird to write online but it's all it works and she was saying she did like 240 shows in 2019. It's like 240 shows. Oh my God. Um, but anyways, cool. So it, it just, I think, it, I don't know how it happened. It just kind of grew. And I, I think it's a combination of Jack really knowing and understanding the internet and the band having a cool factor to mm-hmm. it to some degree. And also just the musicianship. Um, I don't know. It's really fun. I think it's, it's cool the way that it's worked out. Obviously it's it's cool for us. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really hard to explain in some ways. It kind of feels like a fidget spinner. You know what? (laughs) Yeah. How? Uh, How? (laughs) (laughs) There are so many cool toys in the world. Yeah. Why was the fidget spinner just such a huge thing. <laughs> Wait, so are you saying why was Wolfpack such a huge thing, just like the fidget spinner? Are you being well? I, I, I that would be downplaying. You'd be any self-deprecating, yeah. Yes, it would be, but and 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 it would also <laughs> say that it's a flash in a pan because who has? A, I mean, I think everybody actually has a fidget spinner somewhere in their house. <laughs> Not everybody, but I wish I'd had one because a lot of people got a lot of hits by doing fidget spinner guitar videos. And I just, I didn't, I didn't cotton on. (laughs) Well, if you didn't feel like you were passionate about it and didn't do it, there you go. That's why you didn't do it. Uh, That's one of the things I didn't do. Yeah. Yes. You stuck to your, uh, your ideals. 
No, I, I that would be self-deprecating to say it's like a fidget spinner. But I, the, there's something in it where it's like, ah, it's kind of an anomaly to the industry being an independent band. Um, I don't. There's so many amazing bands. Why did why has Wolfpack gotten really big? I don't know, but I'm sure happy that it has. And yeah. I think there's a lot of things that contribute to it beyond just the visual representation that Jack has put together and the overall branding of it. That completely in itself is not even talking about the music. And yeah. I think the music in itself also has something, um, a, a, a vision and a, a thing to it that, there's a lot of intangibles that come together to make something that has become tangible. Yeah. And I think that's what's really kind of cool. And also I, our, our personalities are all unique and they're all somewhat interesting. Mm -hmm. And I feel like each of us, our personalities have a magnetic thing to them almost in the way that like we're all kind of cartoon characters at this point in the band. You know, Jack has his outfit and his thing and his personality. I have my outfit, my thing, my personality, Theo, Joe, Joey, Woody, Antoine, everybody, everybody's kind of got like, oh, Antoine, he's the guy that wears the vest and is just like the most insane singer. And he comes out and just hypes the thing up. And, you know, there's, there's certain things. Oh, Woody, he's the guy that likes the birds. And he's like, you know, a little more chill, but he's got the really sophisticated musical thing. And he's got a certain writing style. Joey's the guy that's really into basketball and he sings and plays sax and keys. You know, I mean, everybody's got their, their personality, which yeah. is kind of, a, a which has, the, the analogy I would make is kind of like, we're, we're each our own cartoon character, which kind of makes for something interesting also, which again is, yeah. is an intangible that kind of becomes tangible when it's mixed with all the other elements. And again, even as I say this, it doesn't have anything to do with the music. The music, I think, can stand on its own, but all of these other things come that come play. along with it mm -hmm. are, to me, something that, that helps make it more interesting than just, oh, this band plays really great music. Check them out. Uh, you know, what, what is it, 20,000 people? How, I don't know how many, Madison, you know, the live video from Madison Square Garden. Uh, just, it's so spine-tingly thinking, like it must have been just so magical as well was did it feel like a culmination of just that kind of if if you see it as a roller coaster like yeah. what a way for that roller coaster to was it 2019 20 it wasn't yeah. earlier this uh 2020 yeah, was yeah. It? it was september of 2019. 2019 yeah and i just remember like the instagram post from the time being like we made we made it happen guys we played madison square garden yeah. like must have been yeah so dreamy. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm getting goosebumps hearing you talk about it, just because um, I think for all of us, I think many of us thought that maybe maybe we would do that sort of thing. But for me, I thought, oh, like someday I'll um, like James Valentine will break his arm and I'll, I'll sub for him for a month in Maroon Five, and it'll happen to be like I'll play Mayor Madison Square Garden or like uh, you know. <laughs> or, or Rob Harris will accidentally break his arm and he'll call me to sub for Jamiroquai and we'll mm -hmm. be in a play mess. I don't want either of them. I don't want that scenario to happen for either one of them. No, of course not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, or, or something like, um, you know, Dua Lipa needs a guitar player or a bass player and she'll hire me for a tour and then that's how I'll play it. But to think that, you know, for me, that was a double header because the Fearless Flyers were the opener and Wolfpack was the headliner. So to think that these two original bands are the thing that that got me first playing at Madison Square Garden is insane. And, and that was that feeling for all of us. And to see Jack as the visionary and the band leader for Wolfpack, to just be able to say like, dude, this is your vision. It's come to life in such a way that nobody thought it was really special. And and you're talking about the roller coaster. There was an extreme, extreme mental roller coaster for Jack going into it. And for, for some of us as well. I'm more of, all right, we're doing this thing. I'm going head first. We're going to crush this. Like, I will make sure every all the objective things that we can control 
or at least that I can control, are going to be handled so I can go into this thing and absolutely crush it. And then if there's anything else, you just prepare your instincts to, to be able to handle anything else that's thrown at you. Mm-hmm. And Jack, it was, there's just so much more because if something really goes wrong, it's on him. You know, he has to be the one to post online, hey, sorry that this happened, or hey, sorry that blah, 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 this, this, this. So there's an emotional roller coaster leading up to it. But then once we're there and we're in it, it's kind of finally, all right, we're doing the thing. But to be able to take it in and, you know, to be able to get off stage and, you know, most of our parents were there. And for them, my, my, my brother was there taking photos down in the pit and side stage and everything. And, and um, you know, to, to get off stage, run backstage, and then see all of our parents, like all of our families coming through the door to say congratulations. And, you know, it was really, it was special. Like, it, it felt as good for me to hug my dad after the show. It felt as good to watch Antoine hug his mom and Joe mm-hmm. to hug his mom. It was like, it was, it was a very... Um, it was just something really fun that like we were able to celebrate for ourselves, for our families to celebrate with us and for us, you know, because, um, well, because of all the obvious reasons and, and just the amount of work and support that it takes to be able to dedicate your life to something like this and not have a single song on the radio, not have a label behind it, not have, like even the booking agent going into the gig saying, no, you're not going to book the garden. We're not doing the garden. And she's saying, book the garden. We're going to, no, you're never going to say, we need to do at least three years before you can play the garden. Jack's being like, no, we can do it. Book the garden. Wow. And, and for that to, for him to, to climb Everest that way is, is very, it, it, that's what it felt like. It felt like being at the top of Everest, like, dude, you carried us up here. Mm-hmm. Like we all, we, we were all part of it, but Jack really helped carry us up the mountain. And I think that roller coaster, you know, and again, maybe he would hate that I put so much on him again for this because it, it was, it was, it was like standing at the base of Everest, looking up at it before we started. Mm-hmm. And when we got there, it was just, it was really fun. So, but now tell me, reveal all your daily routine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's less about daily and it's more about weekly tasks is how I think of things. Here's the stuff I need to get done this week. And there are occasional things like today, hang out with Mary online at this time. Okay. Like there's some stuff that's just on the calendar, Mm -hmm. but I don't have a ton of things when I'm home that are need to be done at a specific time. Sometimes I have certain calls or meetings or whatever that I have to do. Great. But a lot of it is, here's the tasks that I need to get done this week to get towards this goal, this goal, this goal. Goals being finishing certain projects. So at any given time, I'm normally working on one of my own projects. I'm normally producing somebody else's album. And I'm also working on video stuff. And I'm also, you know, I, I write, I try to write like five songs a week-ish. And um, that's a completely arbitrary number. Sometimes it'll be eight. Sometimes it'll be two. Sometimes it'll be zero. But it, it, I'm a lot, I'm very task driven. So I have a handful of things on the calendar. Uh-huh. But other than that, it's just uh, right now I'm writing material for a new album and other stuff. And I'm producing a couple albums for a couple artists. And it's just plugging away mm-hmm. at doing that stuff. And I try, I, yeah, I do think, like, I try to work out every day. I try to, if I have a morning routine, it's waking up, having coffee, little light breakfast. Right now, making sure that my kids are getting their school stuff because they're doing school at home. Mm-hmm. Um, get logged in for your morning meeting. Make sure you got your schoolwork. Did you eat breakfast? Cause you're going to be just as crabby as I am if we don't eat our breakfast <laughs> and you know, it's, it's some of that stuff. Managing the family thing just inherently is part of the thing. I try to do something active every day, but it's just, yeah, plugging away at, at a bunch of different projects. I don't have a, all right, I need to practice 90 minutes today. And then I need to practice 
practice guitar 90 minutes, practice my bass for 90 minutes. And I was like, oh man, I got a lot of emails today. All right, let's do this. And then, yeah. all right, uh, I got to sit down and play guitar. Oh, I I need to put, I I need to get that demo together. That's right. They wanted to get that today. Okay. um, Let me quick mix this thing. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, This, you know, and the downside of all that routine is I don't have set hours. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to sort that out. Yeah. But what do so just as a final thing, like, is there anything you'd like to push and plug and say you've got coming or anything promotional wise? I have a new album coming out. I have a new project that is my most ambitious project yet. Okay. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm doing, wait, when is this video coming out? Uh, it might be, it might be a few days or it might, it, within, yeah. within a week probably. So I have a, a new project coming out that I'm doing on my, it's a show on my YouTube channel. I'm doing my own show. Okay. It's, it accompanies the album. Um, stepping into some new territory this year. So I don't know, smash that subscribe button, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Ring that bell. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. You can find me on on YouTube, Spotify, any of those places where artists put their things. I'm mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Most places, not every place. All right. right. Well, have a good rest of your day and uh, I'll speak to you soon. You too. Peace. Right. Bye, bye, bye. You will be able to tell I thoroughly enjoyed chatting to Corey, but it's now time for Patreon of the day. So I'm going to generate a number. 502. Matt Zofchak, you are my Patreon of the day. Thank you so much for your support. And obviously, thank you to everyone else for supporting me too over on Patreon, but also for watching this video. If you liked it, please subscribe, give it a thumbs up, comment below with your favourite part, your favourite question to Corrie, and yeah, I'll be seeing you very soon.